Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. All right. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for today. <clears throat> I thank you for your word, and I pray that your word would, would just come pouring out of this message today, that your heart would come pouring out of this message, and that you would pierce our hearts with your word, and that we would hear it, that we would do it, that we would not forget it. Lord, I thank you that today is... You have prepared this meal for us today, for it to not just be food, but for it to be equipment for us to carry into our lives and our pursuit of you. Father, I pray that we would hear this as truth, that we would fully receive it, that we would remember it. In Jesus' name, amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 16 through 18. They're pretty short verses. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Everyone say rejoice always. rejoice always. Okay. There's something that we need to understand about the word of God. And that is that it doesn't like to make suggestions. It doesn't like to make recommendations. It doesn't like to ask us if we care. Okay? The word of God says do this, most of the time, do this. It doesn't say, do this if you want to. It doesn't say, do this, it might help you. It says, do this. It's a command. And right here in this first verse, verse 16, we're reading, rejoice always. Let's say it again, rejoice always. Do you know what rejoice means? It doesn't necessarily mean to dance around, to hoop and to holler and to jump and to shout or to even laugh. It might be a product of this, but the word rejoice means to be glad. That's all it means. And Pastor Dave was actually kind of touching on this concept in his offering that he was receiving earlier. But if we're reading something like rejoice always, we're reading be glad always. It's telling us to be something not to let something make us glad. It's not saying wait till something good happens that makes you glad. It says be glad. And that's especially noted with the word always. This is saying be glad always. How many in here are are glad always? Keep your hand up if you're lying. No, honestly. <clears throat> being glad always. It doesn't necessarily mean you can't be sad. It doesn't mean you can't be mad. I mean, the word gives us permission to do both of those things. But being glad is like 
supposed to really, if I'm supposed to be glad always, it's supposed to really serve as a foundation for everything that comes in my life. For the foundation for every word, the foundation for every thought, the foundation for every action is supposed to be gladness because it says be glad always. Not be glad sometimes, but be glad always. And I know some of you are like, that's not physically or emotionally possible. But that's because gladness, like I said, is not just a natural response to circumstance. It is a constant state of mind mind that you and I are to be in at all times. A constant state of mind, seeing through the lens of gladness all the time. Now, there's a way that we can do this. If the word is saying, be glad, first of all, I want you to know that it's possible. Because God is not going to ask us to do anything that is impossible. Even healing the sick, I know we like to say he's the God of the impossible. I mean, I guess we're saying that today, so I'm not trying to like, you know, poo-poo all over the worship or anything. But, but even saying he's the God of the impossible, you know, with enough faith, he just becomes the God of the possible. It's just, it's all possible. It's not impossible anymore. So in this way, gladness all the time, being glad all the time is possible because we're being told to do it. Anytime the word tells us to do anything, that means it's possible. So I know that rejoicing always has nothing to do with my circumstances. It has nothing to do with what I'm going through. It has nothing to do with unanswered prayers. It has nothing to do with this person just yelled at me or this person doesn't like me. It has nothing to do with any of that because I'm being told to do it all the time. Everyone say always. Okay, if this were about me rejoicing because of my circumstances, it would not say always. Okay? If this was about me rejoicing because of my circumstances, I'm only gonna rejoice when the circumstances are good in my eyes, right? But this says always. Your gladness, and it is a supernatural gladness, is something that you are in complete control of. This is why we're being commanded to do this. God recognizes that being glad, gladness, is something that you and I are in complete control of. What happens when you lose that gladness? Like I said, I'm not saying that you gotta always be happy, have a smile on your face. But gladness actually, when, you, when we lose gladness, that's what gives way to hopelessness. That's what gives way to depression. That's what gives way to faithlessness. That's what gives way to fear. That's what gives way to doubt. Being glad actually kind of serves as a protection against all of those things. I want to read about how we can rejoice always. If you look at this, the next verse here, it says, pray without ceasing. I like how short these verses are, just straight to the point. First verse 16, rejoice always. The next verse, pray without ceasing. Now, I've talked about this one before, but... Pray without ceasing, it kind of has a double meaning to it. First of all, I want us to understand it is impossible to pray all the time. Like in the way of I'm gonna bow my head, and close my eye. You can't do that on your way to work. I guess you can, but not for very long. <laughs> so you can't, you can't do that without ceasing. You can't do that all the time. Pray in that way. So praying without ceasing must mean more than let's everybody bow our heads and close our eyes. By the way, I have not read one time in the Bible where it says, and they all bowed their heads and closed their eyes and prayed, all right? So I've, I've prayed with people staring them right in the face, and it's the most awkward thing you could ever do, because you're praying to God, but you're looking at this person in the face, and sometimes when they're doing it to you, you're like, you, you feel so intimidated, <laughs> like, because they're like, Jesus, I pray that you would bring healing right now. Like, Haley's, Haley feels intimidated, and I'm not even really praying for her. So, so anyway, re- praying without ceasing must mean more than we're going to 24-7. We're not going to sleep, eat, or go to the bathroom. We're just going to pray, heads bowed, eyes closed all the time. But no, first of all, 
You are supposed to be communing with God 24-7. There is supposed to be a conversation, an internal conversation going on with God all the time. It's not something I reserve for that 30-second spot right before I close my eyes for the day. I'm gonna pray. No, communing with God, fellowship with God, and conversations with God are something that's supposed to be happening all the time throughout the day. Okay, it should be this endless thing. But the other thing that I wanna point out is that it doesn't say specifically, let your prayers not cease. It says you pray without ceasing. The word ceasing means giving up. Pray without giving up. Pray without giving up. Now, like I said, there's a little bit of double entendre there because it's like that kind of does mean I'm gonna pray all the time because I'm not gonna give up on what I'm praying for. But it also means you don't give up, pray. Don't give up, pray instead. <clears throat> are, you, are you with me? Are you awake this morning? <clears throat> okay. So you don't give up, pray instead. Now I want us to notice something, verses 16 through 18. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Notice how pray without ceasing is sandwiched right between rejoice always and in everything give thanks. It's almost like it's giving us a formula for our prayer life. I I think, I mean, don't get me wrong, maybe not, but this is my personal opinion. I think that if your prayer life is just a bunch of gimmies, you are going to be a very sad person. If all your prayer life consists of are a bunch of gimmies, or I don't have, thank you, Louis. or I need, or I want, you're gonna be a very, very sad person. What we have right here is we have pray without ceasing, yes, but it's right between, and even though maybe a different verse, it's in the same sentence, it's right between rejoice always and in everything give thanks. Why is that? Let me give you a, a little picture that happened just this morning. It was convenient that it happened this morning. I've heard my daughter pray many times before, uh, but this morning was on a different level. She's sick right now. Um, She's dealing with some asthma. She's dealing with some other sinus problems, coughing, all that. And that's why she's not here this morning. But every Sunday morning, I wake up around 5.30, and I go into my living room, and I read over my notes, and I pray, and I get ready for the day. Um, get my soul ready and my spirit ready for the day anyway. <clears throat> and when I'm in the living room, I can hear my daughter upstairs when she wakes up. She wakes up pretty early. And she's so, she's so amazing with this because we, River has to eat at seven o'clock. So that's the time that we wake up. And Reagan is four years old and she'll wake up at 6.15 and just hang out up in her room until seven and then come down. I mean, it's almost always seven on the dot that she comes down. I'm like, you can tell time. Like, you know, you know where the hands are supposed to go on that clock. Like, but during this time, she goes through the same routine every day. She wakes up, she sings some songs. First thing, she's got a song in her in her heart. Uh, This morning, she was singing, "God, you're so good." She was singing that one to herself. I mean, as soon as she woke up. After she sings, she goes to the bathroom. And the whole thing is just the cutest thing to listen to. But this morning, she wakes up and she sings. She goes to the bathroom, and then I hear her start praying. And she said, she said, God, thank you for healing my boo-boo. And then she said, thank you for my family. Thank you for providing for my family and thank you for healing my family. And then she said, amen. And it's crazy to me because when we're around her, we have to coerce her into praying. (laughs) Like, we're her crutch, you know. If, If you're around, you're just gonna pray for me. Like, I don't need to do that. But this morning she prayed that and her boo boo is on her knee, it's a little boo boo. But this is all while she's coughing up a lung. I can hear her struggling to breathe. 
and she's saying, thank you for healing my boo-boo. Thank you for providing for my family. Thank you for healing my family. And I was like, that's my message right there. Because she's, she is going through it, and she's one of the strongest, I'm, I'm no offense to anybody in this room, but she's one of the strongest people that I know. Because even when she's going through it, she still finds an opportunity not to think about herself. She's just really sweet, really tender, and she's four years old. And I would like to say that I had something to do with that, but I, I can't help but just chalk it up to God developing her and, and giving her the spirit that she has. But how many times have you and I been coughing, been wheezing, whether it's naturally or figuratively? We've been sick, we've been down, we haven't had much to give, and all we do is complain and whine and cry. And my four-year-old daughter gets up this morning, and the first thing she does, is she thanks God for healing that she doesn't have yet. She was thanking God for something that had not taken place yet. Why? Because she knows that God is going to do it. She knows that God can, and she knows that he will. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with having a prayer life filled with requests. All throughout the word, we read, that is what we have permission to do, to make requests. But there is something that changes. I, don't, I, I wouldn't say that it changes our prayers in the way of making them more powerful. Like, if we add thanksgiving in there, God's more likely to hear us. I, don't, I wouldn't say that. Because if you're praying the will of God, whether you're expressing thankfulness or not, it's what he wants, so it's what he's gonna do. Like, he's gonna hear that prayer. But there's something that it does to you and I. Whenever we add gratitude to our prayer life, there's something that changes in us. I can tell you firsthand times that I've begun a really complainy prayer, really whiny prayer, really poverty-filled prayer. But then I transition. It doesn't do anything for me, but then I transition to a thanksgiving-filled prayer, a gratitude-filled prayer. And I say amen, and I feel like it's already taken place. If I just complain the whole time, request the whole time, give me the whole time, I say amen. I walk away going, well, maybe he'll do it. But if I fill it with gratitude, I say amen. And I'm like, man, that feels like it already happened. It changes me. This, th these three verses that we're reading here, um, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. This is like the formula for gladness, in my opinion. And it goes in this order. If you want to rejoice always, you got to pray without ceasing. But if you're going to pray without ceasing, make sure that you're giving thanks in everything. Add gratitude to your prayer life, and it will make you glad. Add, a, gra add gratitude, not attitude, to your prayer life. Pray all the time, commune with God all the time, and it will make you glad, always. And that's really, <clears throat> I know she's only four years old, but she taught me something this morning, and she might be teaching everybody in here something. And that's that after she prayed that and gave thanks to the Lord for healing, for provision, for things that maybe she hadn't seen happen yet, she gave thanks to the Lord for that. She you can ask her if she needs medicine. She says no. You can ask her if she needs to rest, or you can tell her she needs to rest, but she doesn't want to rest. 
She's like, no, I'll deal with this. I know she's not really thinking that intelligently about it, but there's something in her going, I'm going to deal with this, and I'm still going to enjoy life. And, and I'm so protective of her because I grew up with asthma, and I know how, I know how debil- debilitating it can be. And so anytime I hear that coming out of her, I'm like, you know, we need to, I, I don't want you to be feeling that. It just really hurts me. But she's like ready to go. And, and I'm kind of just saying this morning that when our hearts are filled with gratitude and we approach God with gratitude rather than this poverty mentality of like we don't have something or we don't have what we want, we don't have what we need, we don't have yet what we're praying for. We approach God with that way, with, with that. We're not going to leave that prayer or that pursuit of God than feeling better about our situation. When I thank God for, for doing something in my situation, even if I haven't seen him do it yet, it convinces me that he has already done it. It changes my mind about the whole thing. I do want to remind us that this, in verse 18, this does not say, give thanks for everything. (laughs) Right? This does not say, for everything, give thanks. It says, in everything, give thanks. So listen, I'm not saying that you need to, as soon as you get sick, start thanking God for your sickness. I'm not saying that you need to start thanking God for your lack of provision. I'm not saying you need to thank God for, thank God for my broken down car, unless it still works and you are truly thankful that at least you have a vehicle, because I've been there before. I understand that. But, simultaneously what I need to realize is that God, I'm telling you truly, I'm not like a prosperity preacher, but God does not want you to have a broken down vehicle. I'm just saying that. He does not want you to have a vehicle that's on its last leg. He wants you to have something that's dependable, that's reliable, that's strong. He wants you to be blessed with that. He does. He wants you to have something better than that. But this doesn't say give thanks for everything. So I'm not saying you need to go and, and go out and tell God, thank you for giving me cancer. That's not what I'm saying, okay? This says in everything. Everyone say in everything. Listen, you are going to be in everything. <laughs> I know that's common sense, but I need you to hear this this morning. You are going to be 100%, without a doubt, you are going to at some point be in everything. And everything you are in, you are in. (laughs) Okay? So while you are in it, give thanks. You don't have to give thanks for it, but you need to give thanks in it. So you look at this thing that you're standing in the middle of, this trial, this tribulation, this persecution, this hardship, this... Uh, whatever this adversity, whatever it is that you're standing in the middle of, that you're facing, that you feel like you can't get past, decide, well, I'm in it, might as well give thanks. I'm not gonna give thanks for it, but I will give thanks for what I know God wants to do while I'm in it. I'll also give thanks for what I know God has done in the past when I've been in similar situations. I'm gonna give thanks What I want us to understand about prayer is that yes, prayer changes things, but something even more useful for you, the one doing the prayer, the praying, is that it changes you if you pray the right way. And there is a right way to pray. And I promise you, it is making sure that there are thank yous even when you don't have what you're thanking God for or you think you don't anyway. You can thank God for healing all the time even when you're sick because it was purchased on the cross. That's an eternal purchase made for you and given to you for free. So you can thank God for healing even if you think you're gonna be sick tomorrow. You can still thank God for healing because he gave it to you, 
right? <clears throat> you can thank God for provision because that is who he is and it's what he wants to do. Let me tell you, I was inspired by this because we've now reached the ranty part of my sermon. Here we go. I, I'm, I am a bivocational pastor. I'm not ashamed to admit that. I'm a journalist on the side. And what I see in this area, I have to do a lot of research online. I have to read social media things. I have to Google uh, information about different things. And what I see is people just hate everything. Like, they, they, you cannot get somebody to like anything. It's, it's, it's just, it is a, a, a I mean, it doesn't st stand a chance. COVID-19 doesn't stand a chance against this pandemic. Everyone hates everything. And there's so much complaining and so much bickering, so much dissatisfaction and discontentment. It doesn't matter what you do. And I feel sorry for all the people who are trying to produce things to make people happy because it just never works. Every, you do, everything you do is wrong. Everything you say is wrong. And believe me, it's crept into the church. Everything you do is wrong. Everything you say is wrong. You don't do enough. You aren't good enough. You don't look good enough. Whatever. It's just now you're never going to please people, never going to make people happy. And I'm like, I know that's always been a truth, but in 2024, it's like truer than it has ever been that you cannot please anybody. There's just so much complaining, so much complaining. And I get so sickened by it. And I think I'm so sick of it in the world that I've become equally as sick of it in myself. When I begin complaining about what I don't have or how I don't have enough or how I'm not good enough or how things are going wrong at my job or things are going wrong at the school, or my food isn't the way that I wanted it cooked. I mean, it's just complaining about everything. And I have been so, I've had seasons where I'm so down in the dumps, and I'm like wondering what's going on, like how do I get out of this thing? And I promise you, the moment I decide to change my attitude and to start having gratitude, all of a sudden, I'm not in the season anymore. It ends abruptly, almost. Like, man, I've been in this funk for so long, and then all of a sudden I'm like, what? you know what? I am being a child. Like, this is ridiculous. I have so much, and I have such a good life, and God has done so many good things for me, and I focus on that, and I say amen, and all of a sudden I'm out of my funk, and then I can actually see God has been doing something this whole time. I just thought that he wasn't because I was blinded by my own complaints. I, I, if you hang around complainers, it will make you a complainer. I know I've been saying this lately, but I feel like Bailey and I have had to reevaluate who we spend our time with. Nobody in here, I promise. We've had to reevaluate who we spend our time with because there's so many complainers out there. There's so many people who just suck the life out of you. Like everything that comes out of their mouth, you just feel so dead afterward. Oh. Like you, you, you walk away, you know, you might have fun in the moment, but then they leave and you're like, what just happened for the last few hours? I feel like we just entertained the fires of hell and we didn't even realize what we were doing. Like, I want every meeting that I have with another believer to be completely chock full of God himself, him showing up and him showing, revealing to us what he's doing and what he's saying and us being grateful for the things that he's doing and, and the things that he's saying and us being grateful even for what we haven't seen him do yet that we know he wants to do because it's who he is and it's what he said he's going to do. That's what I want. 
<laughs> you know, the, uh, I'm getting off my notes, I'm sorry. I'm going to. Just, I'm, I'm going to try to get us out by 12 today. Um, you know, Jairus' daughter, she died, like for real. She actually died. Jairus' daughter died. And when Jesus showed up to the scene, they had already had the, the professional funeral service going. In those days, you would hire people to come and mourn for the dead. I mean, people would be hired. They'd come and like do a big funeral celebration, if you want to call it that. I mean, it was really like they were hired to come and cry. I'm not, I'm not joking. These people were hired to come and cry for your deceased relative. And they would play sad music. They would mourn, and they'd make it loud. They'd weep and wail out loud to make sure there's, everyone knows there's something sad happening here. And Jesus shows up to the scene, and he sees this happening. And yes, let me tell you, I'm not saying Jesus was a liar, but Jairus' daughter was dead, even though he said she was asleep. The only re- I'm going to get to that in just a second. He shows up on the scene. He sees these professional mourners, and he, you know what he says to them? He says, get out of here. Go and get. You need to leave. He didn't say that nicely either. You need to leave. Why? Because there was like this acceptance before there was faith. This acceptance of the worst before there was faith for the best. And he said, I can't have that around here if I'm gonna do what I'm about to do. And he walks into, in, into Jairus' daughter's room where she's laying dead. She's not breathing, her heart has stopped. He says, she's not dead, she's just asleep. He wasn't lying, it was just his faith was talking. These things that you and I think are so bad and so impossible, you might think, you might see it as dead, But Jesus sees it as sleeping because that is how easy it is for him to change it. Because it is much easier to wake up somebody who is sleeping than it is somebody who is dead. That's a lot easier. And so he was demonstrating his faith in the power of God that was inside of him, even though he was God. I know the Trinity is weird, but that's just how it was. He was demonstrating that by saying she's only asleep because that is how easy it's going to be for me to be able to wake her up from her death. But the first thing he does is he dismisses the professional mourners to change the atmosphere to one of hope. And I'm telling you, let me just say this to you, do not be a professional mourner. Because those are the people God asks to leave the scene. Do not be a professional mourner. Be someone who can look at that situation and thank God for what is about to come because you know how easy it is for him to change that situation. You know that while some people might see that situation as dead, he sees it as only asleep. And with a snap of his fingers or even a touch... He can change it, just like that. So I fill my heart with gratitude. I get the mourning out. I get the sadness out. I get the weeping out. I'm not saying you can't be sad. I'm just saying don't have the perspective that limits God in your situation that says he's not gonna do anything and then this is the end. It is never the end when it comes to God. It is never the end when it comes to God. He can do everything. The disciples said, if rich people can't be saved, who can? And Jesus says, with God, 
All things are possible. And so, really, I'm telling you, the reason that's so important is because they saw it, and Jesus apparently saw it too that way, that rich people getting into heaven was an extremely difficult thing. Why? It's not because you can't be rich. It's because the the richer you get, the more likely you are to depend on the things of this world than on God himself. And that's why he said it's hard for a rich person to get into heaven. But he says it's possible still. It's possible for anybody to get into heaven. So those of you who have been praying for your dead relatives, spiritually dead, to be resurrected and to come to know Jesus, you need to keep on praying, but make sure that you're not praying as though it's never going to happen, but that you remove mourning from the situation, you remove that professional sadness, and you fill your heart with gladness and joy, and you rejoice, and you fill your prayer with gratitude, because you know that God can do anything, even if it means saving that one relative that you have or family member that has been away from Jesus for decades. He can do that. So you fill your prayer saying, God, I thank you for turning them back to you. I thank you for bringing them back to you. I thank you for grabbing onto them right now. I thank you for transforming this situation in the name of Jesus. That is faith. Again, It's not that you can't make requests. It's not that we can't make requests. But there's a difference between a request and a gratitude-filled request. And the difference is faith. A request is maybe, but a gratitude-filled request is definitely. I might have to say that one again. (laughs) Now look at this. It says... Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. And then it says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is what makes it tough. Now, this says, this is God's will for you. And these three things are coupled together. It's about learning how to live a gratitude-filled life. where Everything that I do is a result of the gratitude that I have for what God has done and who he is. But then it says, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So I can make it easy for you, or I can make it tough for you. I can make it easy for you by saying, whenever this says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, it means this is what God wants for you. God wants you to be thankful. God wants you to pray without ceasing. God wants you to rejoice always. I'm making it easy for you, though. I could make it easy for you that way, or I can make it tough for you. And I could say, if you're not being thankful, you're living outside of the will of God. Which one do you want? Do you want the easy part or the tough part? Because this says, yes, this is what God wants. But the tough realization about all of this is that if my life is not filled with gratitude, I'm living outside of his will for me. Everyone in here would like to say, I want the will of God for my life. And I believe that there are probably a lot of areas in which we do. But if you do want the will of God for your life, understand that from from the start of your day to the end of your day, it needs to be filled with gratitude. It needs to be filled with thanksgiving. It says, in everything, give thanks. So when you are in the thick of it and you're experiencing the worst thing you've ever experienced on this planet, in this life, in that, when you're giving thanks, you are following the will of God for your life. If you truly want his will, that is what you will do. Let me talk one more time about complaining. This is something that's been really deeply rooted inside of me because whenever I was a kid, um, when, my, when my dad was away from the Lord. Most of you know this, but he was a pastor before I was born and left the Lord shortly after I was born. But whenever he was a pastor, he preached at this, um, actually he helped build Tri-City in Seminole, um, what is now IFC. He helped build that building. But he had some tapes of him preaching, and yes, they were tapes, they were cassette tapes, I know. He had some cassette tapes of him preaching, 
And I only had three of them. And I got to keep them. And I used to listen to them all the time. Like I would listen to them during the day, but then I would also listen to them at night while I would sleep. I'd put one on and I would just let it play while I was sleeping. And one that I really liked was called Murmuring and Complaining. And as a kid, I listened to this one all the time. It got deeply ingrained in me. It doesn't mean that I never murmur or complain, but I do a whole lot less now than I used to. I am much more thankful now than I have ever been in my life. And it's not because of what I have, it's because I've, t- I've decided to change my mind. But this is ingrained in me. And I wanna give you a warning, everyone look at me. Don't forget, don't forget, it actually wasn't fear that drove the Israelites into the wilderness. <clears throat> God sent them there because they complained. That's why he sent them there. Read it. He sent them there because they complained. So, are you in the wilderness right now? <clears throat> Number 16, God sent a plague because the people complained. God hates complaining. He can't stand it. And you, if you've been a parent, I know you can't either. <laughs> I know you can't. But put yourself in God's shoes, okay? You never parted the Red Sea for your children. I feel like you did when you gave birth, probably. Women. I, I know it's a, it's a hard process. I won't ever experience it in my life. 2024, I'd like to think differently, but I will never experience that. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like you've parted the Red Sea for your children. You've never done anything like that. Sometimes you feel like you've, you saved them from a deadly plague. But you'd like to think that you have. We've never done anything like that before. Put yourself in God's shoes for a minute. These people complained after the Red Sea was parted. I mean, we call them stupid but it probably would have been us too. You think God is gonna part the Red Sea and he's not gonna save you from some giants. <laughs> they complained and God said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go into the wilderness until all of you complainers die. And then we'll try again. Don't believe me? Read it. That's what happened. Go into the wilderness until all the ones that complained die. And then we can try to go with this again. Is there a proverbial promised land that is ahead of you that you feel like you've not been able to enter? You've not been able to reach? There's something ahead of you, a promise you've not been able to reach? Have you littered your conversations with God, with yourself, with your friends, with your spouse? with complaints? Are you traversing this road just filled with complaints? Because it might be keeping you from that promise. I'm just saying, it might be keeping you from that promise. Is your life just in the worst place it has ever been? If it is, are you still grateful? Are you still walking in gratitude? Or are you complaining? Are you negative? Do you think, are you hopeless? What's coming out of your mouth during this time? Again, I see this all the time in the world. And while you can read the Bible and know what it means to be a Christian or learn what it means to be a Christian, if you really wanna know what it means to be a Christian, just look at what the world's doing and just do the opposite. What are they doing right now? They're complaining, they're fighting, they're arguing, they're bickering, they're unhappy, they're not joyful, they're not rejoicing, they're not believing, they're hopeless, they're afraid. If they're doing all that, just don't do that and you'll be good. <clears throat> it's a really clear picture. Yeah, I know I'm not supposed to be that. 
I may not understand what this says all the time, but I know I'm not supposed to be doing that. Right? (laughs) Okay. It does say, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If Jesus was God's will for us, which he was, right? If Jesus was God's will for us, then thanksgiving, gratitude is God's will for us. Just to close this out, turn with me to Philippians chapter four. You getting something today? Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, everyone say, Be anxious for nothing. nothing. Again, is this a, a suggestion? Is this a recommendation? Is this a, if you want to, is this a choice? This is no, be anxious for nothing. Now, I want us to look at this. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The New Living Translation says, don't be anxious about anything, pray about everything. I really like how simple that is. That's basically what we're reading here. But I want us to understand, first of all, and I know I've said this before, this does not say pray when you're anxious. This says don't be anxious, pray, right? This does not say pray when you're anxious. It says don't be anxious, pray. Now, how do you not be anxious? Because this is telling me I'm not supposed to be anxious. I can't be anxious, and I'm supposed to pray. It says be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. I am telling you, some of you probably have anxiety issues that you've been battling for decades, and if you would just shift your lifestyle and your mindset to fill, be filled with gratitude and thanksgiving, you would see that anxiety begin to disappear. There is no pill the doctor can give you that will remove your anxiety. It will just suppress it for a little bit until something else happens and you're anxious again. But if you live all the time contemplating what you are grateful for and what you are thankful for, you will never be anxious again another day in your entire life. If your life is filled with gratitude, there will not be one more thing you will ever worry about, ever be hopeless about, ever be afraid about, ever doubt God about, because you will be thinking about what you are thankful for, not what you don't have, what's not happening, and how empty you are. This is the anxiety killer right here. It's gratitude. I know some of you are looking like you don't believe me. You're still gonna have faith in your doctor and the pill that he gave you. No, I'm telling you, if you want to eliminate anxiety for good in your life, it starts with this, thanksgiving and gratitude. Well, I don't have anything to be thankful for. Are you serious? (laughs) You've never seen hell, but it's real. I promise. We all have something to be thankful for, and that's why it is his will for us in Christ Jesus, because Christ Jesus is something we have to be thankful for. There is always something or someone to be thankful for, to be grateful for, and if you find yourself in that loop of anxiety and worry and hopelessness, practice gratitude on a regular basis and watch it disappear. Some people even have, I know it's popular these days to have a gratitude journal. Why is that important? Because for some reason, 
We remember easier the bad things that happened to us, and it's very, very easy to forget all the good things that happened to us. So you write them all down in a journal to force yourself to remember. And then when you wake up every morning, you grab that journal and you read everything you have to be thankful for. That way you convince your mind throughout the day that it has no excuse to be anxious about anything. Because you may have been there once, but God saw you through it and delivered you from it. And now you're on the other side of it, and you can be thankful for that. You may have been sick the other day, but God healed you. He brought you through it. You may have been poor the other day, but God provided. He brought you through it. Amen? And that's why it says that when we do this all, not just prayer and supplication based on our anxiety, oh God, I don't know what to do, and I'm thinking that's okay. I'm not saying it's wrong. But make sure you're going, you know, I don't know what to do, but God, I know you know what to do. I've seen you do it before. I'm gonna thank you right now ahead of time for what you're going to do because of what I've seen you do before. I'm gonna thank you for it, believing that you're going to do it again. And it says, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension or understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does that even mean? It's exactly what I just said. When I fill my, my prayer life and my life with gratitude, the peace of God protects me from anxiety. It does. The peace of God. And don't try to understand the peace of God either because it goes beyond all comprehension. If I'm going to invite this peace of God which surpasses all understanding, I have to be willing to give up what I don't understand. That's another one. I'll just say it again. If I want the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, I have to be willing to give up what I don't understand. Amen? Maybe you don't get it. You don't understand why is this happening? Why am I going through this? doesn't matter. The peace that God wants to give you that's established through a gratitude-filled prayer life and a gratitude-filled life, that peace is something that goes way beyond your understanding. So stop trying to understand everything. All right, why don't you stand with me? Let's do this right now. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close now. Let's go ahead and I want us to open our mouths and begin to express gratitude to God, whatever it is. It could be something really small, but let's thank him verbally right now for something. There's gotta be something. And I'll give you something if you don't feel like you have anything you have Jesus on the inside of you right now giving you supernatural strength in life. Thank him for Jesus Christ if you can't think of anything else. Let's do that for just 30 seconds right now. Thank God with our mouths. God, I thank you for providing for this church. I thank you for providing for my family. Thank you for healing those who are sick. Thank you for healing me when I was sick. Lord, thank you for taking care of us, for seeing us through the worst of it, Lord. Thank you for protecting us when the tornado came through. God, thank you for giving us provision in that area to be able to rebuild. Lord, I thank you for being with us every Sunday, for moving in power. And let's do this. Thank him for something that hasn't happened yet. How about that? Let's thank him for something that hasn't happened yet. God, I thank you. I thank you for complete restoration, complete restoration of this campus and the way that you desire it to be designed and to be laid out. I thank you for wholeness, Lord, in the name of Jesus, in families. I thank you for wholeness in, in jobs, Lord, that people would not keep experiencing unnecessary conflict in their jobs, but that you would move, Lord, in businesses. I thank you for prosperity to Shawnee in the name of Jesus. I, I thank you for the removal of this stupid stigma on the city that I live in that says that it can never be something in the name of Jesus, I thank you for making Shawnee, Oklahoma something and for pouring your provision and your prosperity into the city that I live in. Lord, so we can be proud of the place that we live. For bringing an end to, to, to crime in our city in the name of Jesus. For bringing an end to cancer in our region in Jesus' name. Thank you for those things. Can you just thank him for something that hasn't happened yet, something that you have yet to see? <clears throat>
just a, just a few more, just a few more, uh, I can't say a few more seconds because it's got to be longer than that, but just, just open your mouth, thank him for something that, that you have yet to see, that you have yet to recognize, that you have yet to see happen. Or maybe it has happened, you just can't see it. Thank him for it. Thank you for healing, Jesus. Thank you for complete restoration. Thank you for peace right now in every life in this room, every heart and every mind in this room for the supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Kotz. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.